Hello, everybody. I am calling this uh, webcast to order. And um, I want to welcome all the participants who are joining us here today for this Pacific Council session. I want to give you a quick overview of our event format. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our wonderful speakers today, and then I'm going to give a brief lay of the land on what we're going to be talking about. And then at about 40 after the hour, we are going to move to que your questions and answer, your questions, so um, you, can, you can participate. And we're just asking you that you put your questions at the bottom of your screen. There should be a Q&A box. And submit your questions there. And then the staff will grab them and um, feed them to me. And I want to um, tell you, you know, please feel free to identify yourself in the question if you would like. Um, when we get close to uh, the hour, uh, then of course we'll we'll come to our uh, conclusion. And uh, just so grateful you're all here. So I want to say thank you for joining us for the Pacific Council's webcast on roadblocks, U.S.-EU cooperation on China, the fifth installment of the Edgerton series on responding to a rising China. I'm Kimberly Marteau Emerson, principal at KME Consulting, board of directors at Human Rights Watch, and most importantly, a member of the Pacific Council. And I'm going to be your moderator. We are delighted to welcome today Dr. Leslie Vinja Mori, Dean of the Queen Elizabeth II Academy for Leadership in International Affairs and Director of the U.S. and American, America's Program at Chatham House. And our other speaker is Noah Barkin, Senior Visiting Fellow for the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to speak with us on this topic. Europe and the United States share a lot in common. Democratic values and underpinnings, regional security interests, support for open trade and fair competition, respect for human rights, and many others. So why does it seem like there's so much daylight between the US and Europe over a common approach to China? On the US side, the geopolitical situation between the US and China has been deteriorating for some time, and it is now at a very serious point. Some believe the US is on a collision course with China towards a new Cold War. The national security point of the sword for the Trump administration is telecommunications provider Huawei, in particular with its 5G network because of deep concerns about the risk of cyber espionage and additionally, past trade violations of the Iran sanctions and theft of, international proper, of intellectual property. Huawei's close ties to the Chinese Communist Party have not helped matters. Over the past two years, the US government has taken stronger and stronger steps to block Huawei from doing any or very limited business in the US or with US companies and consumers. The ground on China continues to shift quickly and actions and statements by the Trump administration in recent days show no sign of easing the tensions. Trump has expanded beyond Huawei, recently signing orders to ban transactions with ByteDance, which owns popular Chinese app TikTok, and also with WeChat, as well as considering or pursuing restrictions on Alibaba and other Chinese technology providers. In another area of tension, last month, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo declared China's vast maritime claims on the South China Sea to be illegal. And just a few days ago, the Trump administration designated Confucius Institutes as foreign missions of the Chinese Communist Party. These come in the wake of not just US national security, technology and trade concerns, but of the crackdown in Hong Kong that started last month and the ongoing repression of the Uyghurs. On his recent trip to Eastern Europe last week, Pompeo warned that What's happening now isn't Cold War 2.0. The challenge of resisting the CCP threat is in some ways worse. The Chinese Communist Party is already enmeshed in our economies, in our politics, and in our societies in ways the Soviet Union never was. That's a big statement. On the European side, between a loss of trust in US leadership and Europe's own geopolitical and economic interests, both collectively and with respect to individual countries, Europe seems caught in the middle on how to respond 
to the intense lobbying from the Trump administration to follow its leads on these fronts. Moreover, China is pressuring Europe to stay engaged, to continue to pursue stronger relations and to conclude an investment agreement with it. While the EU has hardened its position in recent years on certain economic activities with China, some European leaders have been reluctant to go further. On top of these tensions, the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent severe global economic fallout caused in noteworthy part by China's actions have driven a rising public distrust and anger towards China, especially in the US where President Trump has taken every opportunity to point his finger in its direction. China's actions during the pandemic have not been lost on European leaders or publics either. And pressure is building for a cohesive European response, especially in light of Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, and China's efforts, often through fear and coercion, to force countries to halt criticism and stay engaged with it economically. So now let's turn to our conversation with Noah and Leslie. Noah, I'm gonna start with you. The US and EU cooperate on almost every subject imaginable. For today's conversation, through which lens are we viewing US-EU collaboration on China? Well, thanks, Kim. First of all, thanks to, uh, for this invitation and hello to everyone who's taken the time to dial in. I, I grew up in California myself and I realized that Europe is far away. Uh, it, it's not usually front and center of the foreign policy debate on the West Coast. Um, so I think it's great that, uh, that you've uh, invited Leslie and myself to talk about this because I think EU, US cooperation on China is, uh, and on many other matters is absolutely vital. Um, back to your question, Kim, about the lens uh, through which we're viewing cooperation. Um, I think if you go back even as recently as a decade or so, it was easy to sort of break things down into distinct areas of cooperation. You had trade, you had security, technology, uh, human rights. Um, and I think the challenge now is that all these are sort of blending together. Uh, you can be developing and exporting surveillance technologies that have military applications uh, and, and are being used to monitor and suppress populations in, in, in places like Hong Kong and, and Xinjiang. So increasingly these lines are being blurred and there's a number of reasons for that, advances in technology, I think the, you know, the globalization of supply chains, um, and, and also because China is making a very deliberate push to, uh, uh, to integrate uh, civil technologies into their military. Now, in addition to this, you have global challenges like climate change, public health, pandemics, uh, issues that affect all of us and where you really want and, and need broad multilateral cooperation between the EU the US and, and, and many other countries. So I think when we're talking about US-EU collaboration on China, we need to be thinking across a, a very broad spectrum. And we need to be thinking also beyond just the, the US and the EU, which of course is our focus today. Uh, there are a lot of other countries out there, the UK, Japan, Canada, Australia, India, South Korea, to name a few, uh, that need to be part of this discussion. Um, but I think there's a strong argument uh, that the U.S. and Europe need to be uh, at the very heart of this, the topic that we're discussing today. Thank you. That was a really good uh, overview. Um, Leslie, can you walk us through where the U.S. and the U.K. are on this? Yeah, yeah, and I guess I would also uh, echo um, what Noah said. It's really a pleasure. It's an honor to be asked to speak um, to the Pacific Council. I really enjoyed um, meeting many of you when you came to Chatham House. I guess it was last May, Alexandra said. Uh, I remember the visit very, very well, um, as do all of us. But I did have to pause when Alexandra mentioned it because it does feel, I know we all say it, but it really was in a, a different world. And I, and I think actually that holds um, for the question of China and the UK and the US. Um, the UK, uh, you know, it's funny to talk about the UK now and 
on a, on a conversation that, that's meant to be about the US and Europe and China, since of course the UK um, is no longer part of the EU, is trying to still work out what that means. Um, in the middle of a pandemic that has been handled very badly uh, in the UK and, and uh, subsequently that means that the dominant focus in the UK, um, not unlike the US, is, is very much a domestic one, right? The imperative of the moment is really the economy um, and getting, getting people back to work. The numbers in terms of um, the infection rate and deaths uh, certainly don't compare with what's happening uh, in the United States right now, but that is the overwhelming context. On China, um, it's, very, it's been very interesting to watch because the picture has changed markedly throughout the course of the pandemic, um, but it's a complicated one. I think, you know, when you think about the UK, uh, the dominant concern is what will happen in its trading re relationship with the United States and in its trading relationship with Europe, and at some level, that is a lens that is always um, is always at the front of decision makers' minds when they're thinking even about China. Uh, the second thing I think to note is that the UK um, obviously has a very complicated uh, relationship to the current US president. And that makes it more difficult to that faction of the British leadership that would like to align um, more closely with the United States Trump is actually um, a, a very significant complicating factor in that. The other way of looking that, at that is that if there is a change of leadership um, from January 20th, we will likely see um, greater cooperation and certainly much more willingness uh, for the British government to consider an, a range of options um, that perhaps bring it closer uh, to the US position. But I think, um, two things are, are really important to know. One of, one, of course, is that the pandemic and the origins of the pandemic, the cover-up have, have affected uh, public opinion uh, in the UK and certainly opinion amongst the leadership. But the second thing is, is obviously really Hong Kong, which has turned the tide um, in the UK. So pressure from the United States on Huawei, we've seen the, the change decision from January, um, where the UK talked about, you know, 35% and a dis holding a distinction between core and non-core, and now a real reversal uh, on that. That is a very significant uh, decision for the UK to walk that back. Clearly, it's a function of uh, US policy with respect to um, sanctions on providers. Um, that made it untenable for the UK to hold its position. Nonetheless, it was a very significant change because it was a walk back from what had been very welcomed by the British establishment, which was seen to be a very independent position taken by Britain that was independent, um, especially of, of the United States and of the Trump administration. The question of Hong Kong, though, I think is really one where we're seeing a, a very dramatic change um, in attitudes towards China. Uh, because of course of Britain's historical relationship, we saw that Britain was immediately um, willing to talk about a path to citizenship for overseas nationals who are resident in Hong Kong. Um, there hasn't been a move on sanctions, on human rights sanctions, uh, despite pressure from Pompeo. But um, and any number of measures, I think we're seeing Britain begin to take um, a harder line. Having said that, and I'll, I guess I'll end here because there's a lot to talk about, you know, uh, if you think about Britain overall and its position on China, it's much more pragmatic. It's wanted to hold the line, even as things are changing now, there is an overwhelming... Oh, did you freeze, Leslie? Noah, you're still good, right? I think Leslie froze. I'm good. So when it's going to impede some- There you are. Control. We lost you for a second. You froze oh, first. No, okay. Can you, yeah, you were just, you were talking about how the UK has, is very pragmatic in its um, approach towards China, despite all, and then I, we lost you a little bit after that. Uh-oh, I think we lost you again. Okay, um, why don't uh, I switch to Noah now? I'm gonna jump to our next question and then we can, Leslie, I'm sure can chime in a little bit later. Leslie, you're, you're still frozen. 
Um, Alex, why don't you uh, text her and let her know that? I'm, maybe she's aware. Okay, Noah, pre-pandemic, um, how, how has Europe's approach to China differed from that of the United States in recent years? So I'm talking about before we get to today where we are now and what has now happened since, you know, it's kind of like what Leslie was saying, what's happened since the pandemic began? Because what I find interesting is German Chancellor Merkel has been consistently pro-engagement, pro-dialogue, and Germany currently holds the presidency of the EU, so it has a lot of influence. Um, what changes are we seeing in the EU's thinking on China? So first we'll start before, and then we'll get to where we are now, and also how unified or divided is the bloc in its desired approach. So let's get a little bit into that. I well, think I, I think it's important to make clear at the outset that Europe's line on China has been hardening for, I would say close to five years. Um, mm -hmm. It started before the Trump administration came in. Uh, and that was driven mainly by concerns about Chinese acquisitions of German high-tech companies and, and, and uh, European high-tech companies in other countries. Um, the 2016 purchase of a German robotics maker called KUKA uh, was sort of a, a wake up uh, here, in, here in Germany um, by, by a Chinese company, Midia, uh, and, and also China's uh, uh, Made in China 2025 strategy, which was unveiled in 2015, was also seen as a real threat to German industrial prowess. Uh, and so we did, we did see this sort of, uh, this pushback uh, starting back in 2016, 2017. There was a re realization that China was moving up the value chains much faster than I think many people expected. Um, it was moving into Europe, it was buying up ports, energy grids, companies in strategic sectors. And this was all part of a, a grand plan um, so the EU began working on this uh, uh, investment screening mechanism, which is sort of a softer version of, of CFIUS, the US, uh, US screening, uh, screening uh, facility. Uh, and it came out with a connectivity strategy in 2018, uh, which was a reaction to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the 5G debate started kicking off at the end of 2018. Uh, and then in March of last year, uh, the EU came out with this, uh, with this strategy paper on China, which got a lot of people's attention because they labeled China as a systemic rival, which is language that you might, you might hear in the U.S. Uh, you know, every, every day. But uh, in, in, in Europe a year ago, or a little over a year ago when this paper came out, it was quite a, quite a shift in language uh, for the EU. Now, um, uh, now, that, that, that strategy paper also described China as a, an economic competitor and a partner. Um, and I think that's what is the real difference between the EU and the US um, when, when looking at China. Uh, in the US, the discussion is very black and white. And in, in, in the EU, uh, it's, it's more gray. Um, uh, it's not so much about containment, about isolation, uh, it's, it's, it's basically saying, look, we need to push back in certain areas, but we need to remain in conversation with China. China is the second biggest economy in the world. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a country that we're going to have to deal with, uh, so we better find a way to do that. Now, um, you know, as Leslie was, was saying, since the, the pandemic, we've had a, we have had a shift. Um, in, in, in Germany and many other European countries. Uh, I think uh, Angela Merkel entered 2020 uh, concerned that there was too much focus on China as a rival. Uh, and, and she was very worried about the escalation between the US and China. She wanted to put the emphasis back on partnership to prevent the relationship from sort of spiraling out of control. So she announced plans as part of the German presidency of the EU to host this summit, uh, which was to take place next month in, in the East German city of Leipzig. Uh, Xi Jinping was gonna come, all 26 other EU leaders were gonna be there, and they were gonna talk about cooperation on climate change, on African development. Um, 
the pandemic has basically completely disrupted this plan, I think in, in two ways. First, it just made it very difficult uh, to prepare for and, and to hold this summit. Um, so, so it's been postponed indefinitely. Um, but more importantly, I think Europe has seen a different side of China emerge in this crisis. A much more aggressive, assertive China that was exploiting Europe's own slow reaction to the, to the crisis in the early, early weeks and months, um, spreading disinformation, deepening divisions within the EU, bullying countries who are criticizing its handling of the pandemic. Uh, and of course, over the past month, as Leslie mentioned, uh, we've had this crackdown in Hong Kong, which uh, has had a serious impact on, on how uh, EU countries view China. So this has really changed the debate in Europe. Um, holding a summit with Xi Jinping right now, I think is, is very difficult to imagine. Uh, you know, pandemic or no pandemic. Um, so there's no question that the biggest shift happened in the UK, but uh, the mood has, has definitely shifted in Berlin, in Paris, in Rome and other capitals as well. Wow, so much in there, you know, I feel like we could just like unpack all those little pieces. Leslie, you're back. Are you back? Or are you frozen? I think you're having difficulty with your connection. Darn it. Um, I'll have so, UK. Yeah. <laughs> Are you there again? Are you uh, here? Yeah, I am. I'm sorry. It's I never had this before. So it's very, uh, it's very, it's very entertaining to know come in and out of the story of the last um, few years. <laughs> well, what, and so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose you a fresh question and hopefully this will stay steady. Um, uh, I wanted you to tell us about actually, uh, the U.S. approach to Europe and the U.K. What is the strategy that the U.S. is pursuing and how is that being viewed over here? Uh, yeah, in the U.K. I mean, I, I, I'll say- yeah, You can talk about the U.K. and, and now I can chime in on Europe. Yeah, I mean, and again, it goes back to some of my starting point, which is that I would say counterproductive at best. Um, and of course, um, and, and that is that is not only uh, America's approach to the UK on, on the question of China, but it's sort of the overarching approach um, over the last several years. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of goodwill that um, the United States has to, to draw on when it comes to its relationship with the UK, not least uh, in terms of foreign policy questions of trade, national security, human rights, and, and China, even though there's for a long time been a difference of view. Um, Britain's desire to attract investment and to really draw on, on um, China's investments uh, is, is well known going back, especially to 2015. And I should say our chairman, Jim O'Neill, was, was very much part of you know, George Osborne um, and David Cameron's uh, golden age of really, you know, how do we get China to invest? And I would say that Jim's position, you know, I talk to Jim on a regular basis. Jim continues to feel um, that we're making, and he's very vocal about this, that we're making the wrong, we're taking the wrong steps. Uh, we, the U.S. certainly, but also the U.K. when it comes to China. So I would say that the, you know, the U.S. pressure has been um, uh, in classic, and I say this, you know, with a great fondness for my country, in classic um, American terms, it hasn't, it's been lacking in the kind of subtlety that's deeply valued, um, certainly in the U.K. Uh, it's been seen to be lacking in a degree of pragmatism. And um, it's been seen to be on the back of several years in which the U.S. has really um, drawn down on its reserves of goodwill and, and willingness to continue to work together. Nonetheless, um, Britain's caught between a rock and a hard place in terms of um, its choices, its alternatives. And China's given it uh, fewer and fewer reasons to believe that holding a, an a open door and remaining pragmatic um, is the way to go. But I think if you look at, you know, obviously we're seeing within parliament, you know, a, a differing groups develop, the Chinese research group, which is a much harder line on China, and much more sympathetic to the current US position. Um, but quietly in the corridors and the conversations, I think there's a very deep concern 
uh, about two things. One is, you know, what does it mean for cooperation on the really big challenges that, that Noah mentioned at the start, that the pandemic, pandemic prevention going forward and climate change, and also really negotiating some fair trade rules that are just essential to stabilizing uh, the trade order going forward. Um, and I think there's also, I guess I would say, a real concern that as the, um, as the focus shifts, and this, to Noah's point of, you know, it sort of all comes together now. We used to be able to talk about trade, technology, national security, and human rights. And, you know, Britain was really concerned about trade and technology and, and really not so concerned about national security and human rights. And yes, they are merging. And I think for the UK in particular, this presents some real difficulties. The pressure on values and on human rights, I think is exactly where much of the British foreign policy establishment doesn't really want to go. And I think the most telling thing is that now, even with the um, sanctions regime that Dominic Raab has, has embraced, uh, China hasn't been first on the list, right? Other countries have, China hasn't been first on the list. And that's very interesting given the context that we're, that we're currently in, that it's still mm -hmm. been there's a reluctance because once you go down that line and it becomes about human rights and values, um, arguably, you know, I think the view here would be amongst many, but not all, that you lose your leverage because it's hard to know what does it take to lift the sanctions that makes it possible to start talking about free and fair trade and climate change and all the other things because the prospect for meaningful change that's brought about through sanctions on question, the hardest human rights questions um, is one that I think a lot of people are very skeptical about. Not that they're not committed, not that they don't believe in human rights and, and um, democracy. They just don't think they can get there? They just don't think that sanctions are gonna necessarily get you there. I, we can have such a good offline discussion about this. <laughs> I want it. a very important debate, and I think we, we have a you, range of views, but I just think that's where a lot, of, a lot of the concern is. Well, that is, in particular, seems like when we need a coalition of countries, um, if you want to create pressure, because otherwise you'll get peeled off one by one. Um, Noah, how about Europe? What do they think of the U.S. strategy, and how are they reacting to it? Well, I think there are a lot of questions in Europe about what the end game is. I, I hear this quite a lot. Um, and you also hear it from uh, experts uh, in, in, in the US in Washington uh, who say, you know, an attitude is not a strategy. Um, so I think there are questions in Europe about, what, you know, what, what the end game for the US is, um, uh, whether, whether the US has an end game uh, or, or a, a developed, uh, a well-developed, well-thought-through strategy. Um, I think we had, um, you know, it, we had a very, uh, at, if you go back to 2018, the Trump administration um, was putting huge pressure on, on, on European countries on the 5G issue, for example. Um, and, you know, this was, uh, there were lots of there were lots of questions uh, and 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 doubts about uh, what the U.S. was saying. First of all, because uh, this administration has gained a, gained a reputation in Europe as as not always uh, not always telling the truth. Um, there was a, a lack of sort of a substantive discussion on 5G. I think in Europe they felt a lot of countries felt they were getting a, a sort of getting orders rather than evidence. Um, the debate on 5G has moved on now, um, and I think Europe will end up in a very similar place uh, to where the U.S. is. Uh, sure. you, you won't see outright bans on Huawei, uh, but you will see many countries phasing Huawei out of their uh, telecommunications networks. Um, so this is perhaps not the big bone of contention that it was, but you know, Europe has, has uh, I think, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron has gone to Trump on, on a couple of occasions and said, Let, let's work together on China. And uh, the response has been, uh, you know, Europe is worse than China. Um, and I can do this on my own. So uh, as Leslie said, the, um, uh, the, the, the willingness to engage with Europe on China uh, from the Trump administration has been fairly limited. Now, there are people 
in the National Security Council, in the State Department, who understand that, you know, in order to confront some of the challenges that China poses, you need to uh, work with allies. I mean, that's really America's biggest strength in a way, you know, and China's weakness. The U.S. has allies all over the world, um, and, but it just, in, you know, in recent years, it just hasn't really been taking advantage of that. Um, so, by the way, I want to remind everybody who's on this, all of our participants, to please um, put your questions into the Q&A box. We've got a few more minutes that we're going to continue our discussion, and then I'm going to be turning to your questions. So, um, please feel free to ask, um, get ready to ask. So, um, well, that, that's interesting. So you mentioned 5G and, that, and that's interesting that you think that Europe is going to, you know, get there eventually. I, I was reading into certain, but then there's all these other restrictions that, you know, Trump is, you know, banning um, TikTok and WeChat. And now, um, even though it sounded like he had a personal relationship with the head of Alibaba, but he's, you know, Pence or Pompeo was talking about a clean cloud and Alibaba provides cloud services. So, you know, where do you think that, you know, what are the major sticking points? Are any, are, you know, is, is Europe anticipating it's going to get tons of pressure and the UK on these, you know, other levels of technology and, do we see the dominoes falling on the Confucius Institutes all over the, you know, Europe? Because that, that, you know, I mean, Trump just called them out like a few days ago. So I'd be curious. So um, why don't we start with you, Noah, then we'll bounce to Leslie on that. Yeah, I mean, I think Europe has been, I, I think, you know, the Trump administration uh, did, even though it, it was a bit awkward and, and clumsy in the way it did it. I think uh, it, it did Europe a service by uh, raising the 5G issue and not letting it go because um, I remember back at the end of 2018 here in Berlin asking people about this issue and it was very hard to find, you know, and this is only a year and a half ago, very hard to find people who, who had really thought about this. So, um, mm. I think like many people in the US, uh, you know, who are watching these executive orders um, come out on, a, on an almost weekly basis, you know, TikTok, WeChat, Entity List, uh, Europe is, is kind of watching all this and, uh, in, 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 and is sort of stunned. Um, uh, and, and I think, I mean, it'll be interesting to see um, uh, if, if some of this continues, for example, if you have a change of administration, um, export controls, uh, this, this very aggressive use of the entity list, use of extraterritorial sanctions. Um, I think uh, Europe is, a, I think while some of these steps um, may be, uh, you know, there's an argument that, that some of them are justified uh, Europe has the impression that the U.S. is just throwing everything, you know, the kitchen sink uh, at China at the moment. Um, so you have a situation where the U.S. is moving very aggressively, very quickly. Uh, and in Europe, you know, uh, much more slowly, much more deliberate, deliberately, uh, the EU came out with this white paper to, to counter Chinese subsidies uh, uh, a couple months ago. Um, that's been about a year in the making. So the EU is taking its time. Uh, I think on some issues, it's behind the US uh, on investment screening, issues like that. Uh, on other issues, uh, it, it, it would say, well, we don't, we don't need, to, we don't need to, to take the sort of actions that the Trump administration is taking. I think you're muted. There I you am. <laughs> I'm muted. I just noticed that. I, I left you uh, speechless. Yeah. Leslie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, uh, I, will add, I will add a couple of things. I mean, I think, you know, some just again, context. One is, um, you know, Europe, and, and I would include the, the UK in this, Europe is not a Pacific power. It's not aiming to be a Pacific power. It's an economic area and it's deeply worried about competitiveness and it's been hit and the UK especially 
in a shocking way by the economic crisis that's been driven by the pandemic. So, you know, I think that is, that is the game and the lens through which you have to think about Europe's and certainly the UK's position on China, which is, can we afford to take a hit um, in any number of ways? And I think the answer is no. And so the balancing act right now is, you know, where are we gonna take the bigger hit? Mm -hmm. And the game right now is simply one, get through the winter of the pandemic and two, get through, or maybe it's one and then two, get through November and get to January 20th so that we know where we stand and we can begin to construct a rational, tactical and strategic partnership with the US and decide where we can work together and where we can't and what that means for our relationship with China. So, you know, in the current zone, we're just simply in a holding pattern, certainly in the UK, trying not to burn too many bridges, but also not enact too many measures that it just really sends um, the economy into uh, more of a tailspin and closes off opportunities. The second thing I would say is, you know, in the short term, the UK has benefited in certain um, sectors from America's ongoing tension with uh, China. And the, the area, and you mentioned um, the universities and the Confucius Institutes where the UK has been much more open church. Um, there is some developing pressure to look at this. Uh, but in 2018 alone, the number of Chinese students coming to UK universities increased by 30%. It's doubled in the last decade. There are roughly 120,000 20, students from China in British universities. That's obviously going to be very, very different this year. Um, the EU and then China and then India, that's where the UK universities draw their students. But the drop between China and India goes from 120,000 down to 27,000, there's no comparison. Um, UK universities are under phenomenal pressure because of the pandemic. Um, and the desire to get foreign students and especially Chinese students back as soon as we get through this will be very considerable. Hmm. So there are multiple pressures coming out of Europe and especially the UK that will drive it to want to cooperate. But if and when, there is new leadership in the United States, it's going to get more complicated because I think what we'll see is a Biden administration that says, we'll work with you on Iran. We will work with you on the pandemic. We will work with you on vaccine dissemination. We will work with you on climate, but we're gonna to be tough on China and we expect you to play ball. That is what people are um, expecting. And the question is then, you know, what is the UK willing to give that it might not want to give? And, and what is the EU willing to give? And what are different national uh, capitals willing to give? Thank you. So what's interesting about what you said, it seems like is there's a recognition in the UK, and I'm thinking, Noah, maybe that's in Europe too, that, you know, getting tough on China is happening from both sides of the party. But depending on the outcome of the election, you know, Noah, what do you think will be the change in, you know, how Europe works with, or the U.S. works with Europe? Well, I, I, I think the, the presidential election is, is huge uh, uh, for, for, for the U.S., for, for the rest of the world, for Europe. Everybody is watching it very closely. Um, and as Leslie says, we're in a sort of holding pattern um, until we know the result of that election. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say that if Biden is sitting in the White House in on January twentieth, that the divisions, the transatlantic divisions over how to respond to Beijing, will disappear. I, they won't. Um, but I think a discussion can then take place about about strategy about work you know how uh sort of uh, burden sharing and 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 who does what people can sit down at at a, at a at a table and talk about this they haven't been able to to do that with the trump administration um i think as leslie said you will see a real push from the a biden administration on the one hand to repair the relationship with europe but on the other uh to make real demands of europe 
on, on, on China. Um, but the tone will change, that will help. Um, the Europeans have not been able to work with Trump. They don't feel that the United States that is led by Trump is a reliable partner. So mm -hmm. if, if Trump is reelected, this will, I think, accelerate the push in Europe towards uh, what, what people refer to as strategic autonomy, um, Europe first, if you will. Um, and I think you'll see a greater push in Europe to work with other allies, Japan, Canada, India, maybe. Um, and what would be interesting if Trump is reelected is, is uh, you know, uh, the EU and the UK, because I think there you could see, you could see a split with the EU going off in its own direction. Uh, and the UK, despite the, despite the problems that it's had with Trump, uh, feeling like it has no other alternative but to stick with the US. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because if the UK was still a member of the EU, um, it would be, I mean, it's kind of interesting to kind of play that out and think, and think to yourself, you know, would they be, you know, fighting in the room to have the EU be more like the US or would they be more likely to go in the EU's direction? It's, it's you know, obviously an irrelevant question, um, I, <laughs> but it's an interesting one. Um, okay, I wanna, I think we lost um, Leslie for a minute. Hopefully she'll be back on, but we've got you, Noah, and we've got a bunch of questions um, that have come in. So I'm gonna move to those right now. I wanna encourage you to continue to put questions into the box. Um, we have about 20 minutes left to talk. So uh, let's go with our first question from Paul Pass. Uh, if Biden were to win the US presidency, what do we know? Okay, that, I'm sorry. Paul, you know what? We just talked about your question. Sorry, I was just reading it. And I was like, that was the whole thing about what would change in the administration. So I think your question has been answered. Um, I'm gonna go to the next question, which um, is, uh, don't have a name attached to it, but do you expect a market change in the EU's action on China with transition from the Juncker Commission to the von der Leyen Commission? So uh, that's gonna be for you, Noah. Um, you know, Ursula von der Leyen is running the EU Commission. Juncker was the previous EU president. So go ahead and, and give us your thoughts on that. Well, I think this transition did, uh, was quite disruptive because the Juncker Commission had, uh, had quite a bit of momentum on China. They were the ones, Juncker and his, uh, his top aide, uh, Martin Zellmeyer, uh, was the one who put together this strategic outlook uh, in which China was labeled a systemic rival. Um, and then literally a few months later, uh, we had the European elections. And then it, as it does in Europe, it took about half a year for the new commission to, to actually be in place. And we've seen um, the, the new commission struggling a bit, a, a bit in the early months. I think uh, Joseph Borrell, the, the high... Um, I representative, basically the EU's top diplomat, has sent very different signals on China. Uh, there's been a, um, uh, on two occasions, uh, his uh, diplomatic corps have, have bowed to Chinese pressure, um, censored themselves uh, on a disinformation report. Um, the EU ambassador in Beijing uh, adjusted a, an op-ed, uh, um, that uh, on, on, on the request of, of uh, a Chinese state media. So this was quite embarrassing, but I think, so we had this kind of period of, of uh, where, the e, where, the, where the new commission was sort of struggling with this issue. But I think uh, over the past few months, um, uh, it, it, it's become, it's, it's been sending much more, much clearer signals. Von der Leyen had a, uh, a, a virtual summit with Xi Jinping and the Li Keqiang, the prime minister, uh, and, and was very, gave very uh, forthright, very clear, tough news conference after that. Um, and now, you know, as we've been talking about, China's behavior in Hong Kong has, has really uh, changed uh, the dynamics. So I would say in Brussels at the moment, there's not a lot of incentive to... to um, uh, I mean, they, they're moving towards a harder line. And uh, I think we've seen Burrell, who was former Spanish foreign minister, kind of learning on the job, 
hadn't hadn't dealt with with China a great deal. He's he's now shifted to a much much harder harder line. Um, I think Germany is the one country where uh, where it's still sort of up in the air. Mm. Now, um, this this next question is one actually for both of you and ask Leslie to answer it first. Um, this one is from somebody I know very well. His name is Ambassador John B. Emerson. Um, hi, Emma, I can't see you, but just saying hi. Anyway, uh, given Leslie's comment about January 20th, obviously a Biden election would mean a return to a high level of collaboration with our allies, which we already talked about, but not a softening of the US attitude towards China. A Trump 2.0 would mean Trump unleashed, and he would probably undoubtedly feel that his approach to China and to our allies has been vindicated. In that situation, which you guys haven't really been talking about so much, in that situation, would Europe, UK simply strike out on their own vis-a-vis -vis China? Leslie, did you want to? Yeah, I will. I mean, it is, you know, it's 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 a really important question, and um, I do believe, following very closely those people who are truly expert on polls and data and everything, I do believe that we're not heading towards Trump 2.0. But I, we all have been through 2016, and we all know that we have no idea what will happen in the next, especially right now, we don't know what will happen in the next few months, for so many reasons. Um, but I will say that in the UK and in Europe, um, there isn't enough focus on what um, what a Trump, a second Trump administration will would would mean. Um, we talk about it, we ask the question, we begin to have the conversation, and we quickly move back to what what will it look like when Biden's president. So there's not enough thinking. Um, it, there's a natural human tendency to, I think, discount things that are unimaginable. And I think for Europe, uh, a second Trump administration is unimaginable, to be very honest. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, um, I think at the end of the day, and in some ways it takes me to you know, Noah's comments about Europe becoming harder on China and talking about the individuals. And I, and I still tend to think a lot of things are driven by hardcore restraints and by changes in behavior. So COVID, Hong Kong, China's doubling down in South China Sea's stronger line on China, a wolf warrior diplomacy, all these things, you know, maybe it's not the individual. Uh, so what does that mean for a second Trump administration? It means that Europe won't want to work with um, a second Trump administration. Um, I think there will be a, a long pause of dismay and regrouping. And there will certainly be a push along, you know, the same conversations that we've heard for a while from Europe about strategic autonomy and everything else. But at the end of the day, uh, the U.S. has stayed in NATO and China's on NATO's agenda. Um, Europe needs the U.S. for security reasons for economic reasons, that's not going away. The UK is still gonna want that free trade deal with the United States. And so I think what we will see is, first of all, I think we'll see a different President Trump because this will be a president who is free to do what he wants for four years, but also to think about you know, his own personal life. And what we might see is that a US that's sort of, you know, run by the lair, the lair below the president who's now securely been reelected and the bureaucrats, the high level bureaucrats run the show. That I think would be the best case scenario. And I think we would see Europe, the U, including the UK and the US continue to work together in a slightly troubled way. Um, but one way or the other, I think there's really no alternative. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that, that Europe has an going its own way. Mm. Thank you. And we got you just before you froze again, which, oh, you're back. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let me turn uh, this question to Noah. We have another six minutes, so we still have time for a few more questions. Um, U.S. businesses are looking hard at ways to diversify supply chains away from China. As, as such, we're witnessing a decoupling of U.S. and Chinese business interests. Where does the European business community stand? Are there any discussions between EU-based companies and U.S.-based companies to enhance cross-border trade with each other or with South Asia, Asia-South Asia partners? 
And this is a question from Matt McNeil. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. We're, we're, um, we're in a kind of interesting uh, uh, phase now. Um, I've, I've interacted a little bit with uh, European businesses and also US businesses uh, operating in China. Um, I think a lot of them, well, first of all, it's, it's worth pointing out that in European countries have been, I think, diversifying away from China for about five years now, I, I would guess. Um, uh, because the situation in, in China was becoming much more difficult, labor costs had risen, uh, the state was taking a much, playing a much bigger role in the economy. Um, there were, they were, you know, European companies were being forced to have um, uh, Communist Party cadres on their, on their joint venture boards. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there has been a, a diversification happening for a while. I think the pandemic has, is going to shift, um, you know, in, in, in certain areas, in, in healthcare, medical supplies, is going to have a real effect. Um, and I think it's, it's too early to say whether European countries, uh, I don't think they're going to pull out en masse uh, from China. Um, I think when they're thinking about new investments, they're going to be uh, looking at other countries in, in, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, possibly India. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of them are suffering right now, right, because of the pandemic. And the last thing they want to do is sort of, you know, up and leave and, 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 and uh, uh, move their production site to another country when they're sort of struggling and revenues are down and profits are down. So I think this is going to take some time. Um, uh, and I, I would expect this will take time for, for U.S. companies as well who have big operations in, in China. I don't think we're going to have a, a sudden... Um, a sort of co companies fleeing China, but I think we're, over time we're going to see uh, see a lot of movement of companies, new investments going elsewhere. And also, China is the biggest consumer market in the world, so uh, U.S. does not want to, or European companies are, you know, that's a that's the golden handcuffs. Um, so we have uh, a couple more minutes. I want to get to a couple of additional questions. And um, this is interesting. This is an interesting question. I'm going to throw it out there. You guys can decide who wants to answer. This is a question from the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. Thank you for being on the call, the webcast. How could other partners in Asia, namely Japan and South Korea, play a role in the EU-US cooperation on China? And you know, um, this also takes me around to a question I didn't have time to ask you guys, and that was kind of, you know, where are the solutions? Where are the collaborations that are possible? And maybe there's something related to answering this question as well. So Leslie, I don't know if you wanna, wanna start. Oh no, you froze again. So no, uh, you're back. I probably before, I'll be you should, you should I should just, probably try before. Yeah, before you, we lose you again. I mean, I think this is where it gets really interesting and really dangerous. Um, and uh, it gets really interesting because, of course, there are all sorts of different groupings coming together um, to talk about, you know, supply chains. Uh, what was it that we heard today? Um, Japan, India, Australia, I think. Um, uh, there's the conversation in the UK about really pushing forward with the D10, right? Um, uh, I think Japan and South Korea, it's challenging and tricky so long as America remains committed to those security alliances. I'm not so sure how much room for maneuver uh, Japan and South Korea have when it comes to staking out any kind of independent two position on in in a context where the bilateral relationship with the U.S. and China is so heated. So I think that's slightly different. So the, the solution might be a broader grouping of democracies that gives um, other countries a little bit of cover um, rather than kind of staking out of their own. So bringing Europe uh, with Asia's democracies together into conversations. But I guess the dangerous part, I think, is um, doing, you know, the 
risk of doing that to the exclusion vested in the major multilaterals where China is also fully engaged. One wouldn't want to see one or the other because, you know, for the reason we've been saying throughout the call, which is there are multiple areas where we need to see really important um, cooperation going forward, or the entire system is going to break down, quite frankly. Yeah. Noah, did you want to add anything to that on solutions um, in Asia? Because I think we're going to be out of time in just a couple of minutes, but I think maybe we have time for one more question. I'll try to be very brief. I mean, I do agree with Leslie that it, it, it can, can be a bit easier, uh, you know, from a European perspective to have Japan and Canada at the table too, along with the U.S. Um, I think... Um, I think that's going to be one of the big challenges if, if uh, Biden wins the election is to sort of figure out uh, how, to, how to talk with, with other countries. Um, now, I think he'll make a push with Europe, um, but I, I think you have to look at it issue by issue. You know, mil for military, uh, on military issues, do you, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to be talking with Germany. Um, you might want to talk with France and the UK and Europe and, and, uh, and, and countries in the region. Um, so I think it's going to, I, it's going to be very interesting to see if Biden comes in, if we get some sort of D10, if there's a sort of coalition of like-minded liberal democracies, uh, meeting on a regular basis to talk about China, um, or whether it's going to be a bit more a la carte. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what, uh, how, how the U.S. approaches this. Okay, thank you. Last question, uh, Leslie, you there? I'm going to ask you, does the financial impact of Brexit make the U.K. more inclined to take a softball approach to China and prioritize economic cooperation um, with, the, with China over other interests? I mean, you know, yes, undoubtedly that, you know, the UK is economic, perceives itself to be and is economically constrained, uh, not only because of Brexit, but especially because of um, the, the pandemic. Uh, Q2 was bad, right? And, it, and it's not clear what happens when the furloughs end and the pandemic hasn't gone away. Remember that there's still a furlough policy in the UK that runs through the end of October, which in some ways has probably deferred some of the harder consequences of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, but I guess I would qualify it by saying the UK always wanted, <laughs> for a long time, the UK has wanted to um, get investment and trade with China and get access to China's market and certainly to its consumers, you know, it's two way street. So that's not new. Um, but the UK certainly perceives itself as being uh, in a tighter spot. But, you know, the top of the top tier is its relationship and sorting that out with Europe, sorting out its relationship um, with the US and any other number of countries. But in the background, absolutely, there's a very clear understanding of the potential, right? A lot is about the potential of the Chinese market and keeping that alive mm -hmm. post-Brexit. Thank you. Um, I think we, we have two minutes left. And I think in those two minutes, I just want to extend a huge thank you to Noah and Leslie for your extremely comprehensive, intelligent um, comments and, and, and ideas on this. I had the opportunity to read a lot of what you both have read and recorded um, on this issue. And um, there's no end to the nuances and complications um, that, that exist in this, you know, triangulated or even quadrangulated now relationship. And um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And, and there's a lot of work to do. And um, apologies, there's a car outside of my apartment. Um, and I want to just say thank you. And thank you to all of our participants. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, Pacific Council webcast and we'll stay in touch. Great to meet you both. Thanks again.